on interacting with staff and covert entry. We will be interacting, or excuse me, we will be um, highlighting actual engagements uh, that have been used uh, through these techniques, which will leverage techniques in tandem for maximum effect. Uh, finally, we will cover practical methods to combat and thwart these attacks. Uh, so for the sake of time, if you have any questions, please comment in the comment box below. Uh, I will present them to Ryan to address after the presentation. So without further ado, uh, Ryan Jones. Ryan? Thanks, Keisha. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Ryan Jones. I'm a principal with Coal Fire Labs. Um, as Keisha said, we're going to go through uh, social engineering techniques used by us and uh, actual attackers uh, to infiltrate companies. So a uh, quick agenda. I'll go a little bit about me and why I get to speak to you about this stuff. Um, we're going to define social engineering, what it is. So we're going to go through some social engineering techniques, uh, in particular for phishing and email attacks. And then we'll also get into other social engineering styles, such as uh, pretexting, uh, physical, um, and as well as ways to detect and ways to prevent these attacks from being successful. Uh, and then we'll have a question and answer. So at any time when you, uh, you guys are going through the slides with us, um, feel free to dump questions in the, in the question box, and I'll answer them all at the end of the, at the, end of the session. So a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm a principal right now with Coal Fire Labs. Um, I've also worked in a large majority of large consulting companies, my, small uh, consulting companies, uh, and a couple of uh, technical companies. There's a dot-com in there that's not listed. Um, but basically, I've been doing security consulting and penetration testing uh, and social engineering uh, for 20-plus uh, years. I've given talks at various conferences uh, on this topic as well as others. Um, was on a very short-lived TV show and uh, did a podcast that is not safe for work, but um, is heavily based around security. Um, so I would encourage you to listen to it if you're interested, but um, not over company speakers. <laughs> um, so yeah, in particular, <laughs> my mom thinks I do is about right. Um, everything else is just kind of uh, what we actually do is nine times out of ten we're sitting in front of a computer. Uh, with social engineering, it, it People consider that more fun on my side of the fence because uh, we get uh, to get away from the computer somewhat and um, interact with people, interact with uh, physical devices. So what is social engineering? Um, social engineering is basically uh, pretending to be something you're not um, in order to convince someone to give them the information that you want, whether that's a, and then sometimes it's not just information in, uh, in a verbal form or in a data form. It could also be physical information sitting on a, on a computer. Uh, it could be convincing someone to plug in a USB thumb drive. It could be convincing someone to go to a website, uh, open an email, open an attachment. Um, what people are most used to when they hear about social engineering is email attacks, um, also referred to as phishing or, or spear phishing. Um, but I, in, case you haven't, in case you haven't seen them, I know was, uh, I've been getting a lot more of them lately, the SMS messages from, from non-10 digit numbers that are basically saying, hey, uh, go to this link, or hey, try to uh, submit to this survey for us. We'd really like your input. Um, some of those are, are, are social engineering or phishing attacks just done through SMS texting. Um, similar, similar attacks will go through faxes, uh, not as common anymore, obviously. Um, when we talk about pretexting, we're usually talking about phone calls, um, also in-person um, social engineering. And then physical on-site. Uh, and dumpster diving as well, going through those dumpsters, um, defining as much information about the target before we even interact with you guys. Um, thankfully, social, engineer, uh, social engineering has been benefited a lot by social media because um, companies and people love to put uh, a lot of their information out there. So um, if we can find you on social, social networks, we're going to use that kind of information to, to target an attack or to craft an attack. Um, towards your likes, towards what you don't like, towards maybe some information we've gotten uh, as far as like what you're going to go do in the future, maybe vacations you want to take, uh, et cetera. When it comes to companies and we're doing research on companies, we're looking at um, press releases. We're looking at events they may be talking about on their, on their Facebook page that they're going to be doing uh, in somewhere in the country soon. Any kind of information that we can use uh, to craft those attacks. So why, why does social engineering? Um, you know, it, it, mainly because it's the path of least resistance. 
Um, it still works. It works very well. And because there's no firewalls in place, well, the way with the way these most these attacks work, um, there's no there's very little security uh, in these in, in place to prevent these attacks. Um, it's it's a path of least resistance. resistance. So um, when we're talking to people, we're trying to uh, we're trying to be helpful. We don't want to necessarily cause confrontation um, unless it's absolutely necessary. But that's usually the last step. Um, I'd rather appeal to to your authority or you know to your, to your willingness to want to help me solve a problem that I have. Um, I don't want to necessarily bully you into helping me. I'd rather um, be more along the lines of like, look, you know, I know. I know I'm having some problems with this, and if you could really help me out, you know, I'd, I'd, it'd be so helpful. Um, and again, leveraging that information that is out there on the internet um, through blogs, social media, um, places like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And you don't need a whole lot of technology to execute any of these attacks. Um, there's plenty of ways that are uh, you can get a hold of a mail server and a, and a way to spoof caller ID with with minimal cost and minimal technology. And again. Um, with, with especially with the phishing attacks, uh, even if I send out 500 emails at a company and only five people click that link, but that gives me that toehold, that gives me a little bit of, of grasp into that network that I need to, to cause major damage. So phishing, phishing is, uh, you know, in general, phishing is considered an email attack. It's usually custom, uh, usually customized. The ones that work very well are customized to look, for example, with, with the right color scheme, with the right headers, with the right footers that you guys use internally um, to make it look exactly like it came from IT or it came from HR or whoever it is that we've decided to pretend to be. Um, email characteristics, it looks legitimate. So we're going to do research. Um, even if that's sending an email to, say, info or um, in, info at ncdot.org or, or whatever domain um, you know we're, we're going to attack. Um, getting that response email gives us an idea of how emails are phrased, um, how titles are written, how what color schemes are used. Do you guys um, put a bunch of phone numbers and text and email addresses at the bottom of uh, every email? Um, all that information, as simple as it sounds, all that information allows us to create an email that looks even uh, more believable. Usually, we're trying to get you to click a link. Um, in most of our tests, we're, we're, we want you to go to a website that we control, um, and that's, that website is going to ask you for your corporate credentials. And once we have those credentials, we're going to use them to uh, get into things like your uh, VPN connections or your email, and then use that email and VPN connection to get further into the network or to get further into the physical locations you have. Um, if we can get into the right email accounts, then we just start sending emails to the people we need to send emails to as you saying, hey, there's going to be a guy coming in the, in the office in a couple of days. Um, you know, can you make sure he has a guest badge ready for him and, and give him a place to sit? Um, and because it came from an actual email account, um, thanks to you know, uh, compromised credentials, um, that, that's usually a really successful attack. The site that they redirect you to will look legitimate. It will make it look like something that you're used to, whether that's a Starbucks website because you're going to register for a free cup of coffee every week or um, the new Microsoft Outlook website. Um, we're going to make sure that it looks enough like the old website that, that you recognize it. You don't question its legitimacy. And then, like I said before, uh, phishing attacks render about a 5% success rate. But considering uh, the types of accounts we get with that 5%, um, that's more than enough for us to get into a, into a network and, and cause major damage or steal sensitive information or or just hang out and wait for the right time and the right information to uh, to either make a lot of money or or cause damage to the company or help a help a competitor. So when people talk about spear phishing, spear phishing is still emails, um, but it's highly targeted. So instead of blasting out say 300 emails across an entire company, we're going to pick a handful of people um, and we're going to send each one an individual email. Um, you know, we're going to try and find out, again, through social networks, we're going to try and find out who their friends are, who might be emailing them. Um, so if LinkedIn says, oh, this person has you know, communicated a lot with XYZ person in this other company or this other uh, organization of government, we're going to take advantage of that. Um, Twitter uh, also is another huge <laughs> gold mine of, re of information for us. Uh, in, in those same along the same lines, um, 
when we're talking about spearfishing, the characteristics are there's um, uh, it's significantly more personal. Um, again, we've we've crafted that email at you, not at an entire company or entire organization. So it's going to have a lot of familiarity. It's going to have maybe some friends' names or family names in it. Um, it's still going to try and redirect you to a site or get you to open a file. Um, but again, it's going to look way more personal. Um, you'll see a lot more of these. You know, you won't see such a, a laundry list of email addresses in the to field. You're going to see it directed at you. It's going to have your name in it. Um, the same results are, are achieved with this. Um, they're usually a lot more successful because of the personal aspect of these emails. So we get about triple the success rate on these. So how do I identify one? Um, this particular case is, is a test case we used a lot. Um, this is what the email actually looked like. And it says, you know, uh, we, we're at Microsoft, um, or we're using our Microsoft Center uh, in point protection and it detected a virus on your system, um, you know, a large number of successful logins from IP address. We, we create the whole scenario of uh, foreign nations have been detected using your credentials and, and kind of giving you that, that sense of urgency that you have to click this link to, to make sure this problem is, is no longer uh, an issue. We also make sure that you understand that there's a timeline. So you have to, within 72 hours, we're going to lock out your account. Um, again, making sure you, you realize this is very important. Um, when that, that bottom section, that thank you, information security, Carmel Partners, InfoSec, we, we, we've taken all that from actual emails we've seen come from the, from, uh, from the information security group and added that to make it look more real. Now, the spoofed email address, InfoSec at CarmelPartners.com, not, not, not net, excuse me. Uh, we can make that look like whatever we want, um, but in that link is where the, the quickest way to detect it would be. Um, if you hover your mouse over that link, while the link in the left side of the screen um, looks correct, it says OWA.CarmelPartners.net. Um, what it actually, if you hover it over, hover the mouse over the link, you'll see a little box pop up, and that box will tell you it's actually going to OWA.CarmelPartners.net, which is our domain. Um, there's also no SSL on that, in case you notice the HTTPS versus HTTP, um, because if we're if we really want you to believe it, we don't want a message popping up saying, "Oh, this isn't a real cert." You have to make sure you accept it before you can go to this website. Um, we want to make sure you can get to the site as easily as possible. With the email addresses, if you were to um, look at what's called the headers of this email, you would see that this didn't come from Carmel, CarmelPartners.net. It would actually come from, say, um, Lino.com or somewhere.ru or wherever we had built up a, a mail server to send out these emails. But in the headers of the email, you would see InfoSec at Carmel Partners, CarmelPartners.net, and then the actual sender would be you know, InfoSec or phishing at uh, wherever, uh, whatever mail server we had ended up using. If you click the link, you would go to this site. And again, that one-off domain shows up right there um, with that N instead of the M, which at first glance, you wouldn't really notice. Um, and then also at the same time, it's not HTTPS, so you wouldn't see the little uh, padlock at the bottom of the screen. You would, it wouldn't show you as a secured site. Um, but we had basically cloned the Microsoft Outlook web app uh, web page and this is exactly how it really looks, um, requesting username, password, your new password, uh, confirm is new. So we're not only getting your username and current password, but what you want your next password to be in case you change it, in case you did detect this email uh, as, as false. We get an idea of if you, maybe you only increase your password by uh, plus one. So let's say your password is uh, uh, nc.transport1. Um, that would be your current password, and your new password you tell us, you want it to be nc.transport2 or 12 or whatever the next number is going to be, um, where you use some form of the same of a similar password. We're able to detect the changes, and so when we go to use those credentials later, if the password that you had given us was incorrect, we can look back and say, okay, well, their current password was this. Uh, they wanted their new password to be something along these lines. Let's see if there's a, a correlation between the two. It's just a pattern and see if we can adapt that pattern to what the passwords are, uh, what, what password change actually was. So ways to thwart an actual phishing attack, and again, these are the ones that are, that are kind of mass sent across a company that aren't, aren't targeting just you, this is across the entire group. Um, don't believe everything you read on the, on the internet, that includes email. 
Um, when you're looking at the email, try to keep track, you know, pay attention to things like um, does it actually look the way a normal email from corporate would look? Um, does it does it have the correct link when you mouse over that link? Is it, is it mismatched? If it is, then there's a problem. Don't click the link. Um, observe the spelling and grammar. Obviously, you know, these a lot of actual attackers are, are <laughs> English is not usually their, their first language. So there's going to be comma errors, there's going to be spacing errors, there's going to be um, language errors. Spear phishing attacks are a lot <laughs> a lot better at uh, email uh, at grammar and spelling and whatnot just because of the way they're, they're created to go at you. Um, but when a phishing in phishing emails, you, and you'll see them all the time, bad spacing, a lot of copy and pasting, or there'll be some sentences that don't make sense or it's all one giant sentence. Um, and then review the sender address to determine if it actually came from, um, if it actually came from the place that it claims to have come from. Something else to keep in mind, um, when, you're, when you're looking at these emails, uh, let's say you get an email from Wells Fargo, and you actually have a bank account from Wells Fargo, um, don't necessarily just click the link. If you want to make sure it's Wells Fargo, Go to Wells Fargo's actual web page. You know the you know the URL. So just instead of clicking the link, open up a browser on your own. Type in www.wellsfargo.com or google.com or wherever it is that you think you might need to go. Um, don't click the link. Type it in yourself. Um, that way you know you're going to the correct site. You know you're going to the place you're supposed to be going to, and you know you're giving your credentials to the site that you're supposed to be giving your credentials to. Um, if you get an email from HR saying, "Hey, we've got this new," uh, policy we want you to read or these new um, uh, benefits we want you to, to check out and accept, um, instead of just clicking the link because you think it might not be them because you haven't heard anything about new benefits coming down the pipe, call someone in HR and say, hey, did you guys just send out this email? Same thing from IT. You know, um, that, that previous email that I showed you guys, if that person who had received the email had called IT security, which their, their actual number was in that email, um, they could have been told right out that that like no we didn't send that email out, um, and not only does that let the person know to click the link, it also lets IT know that hey something's going on we need to check this out and let our users know. And always be a careful of, careful of attachments. If you have any suspicions whatsoever, um, you know even if it's your friend sending you pictures of something, um, but you have no you know they weren't you weren't expecting those pictures or or the pictures of something that you're not really sure why they would send you, um, be wary of it. Um, Again, reach out to that person yourself. Send them a text. Say, hey, did you just send me a bunch of pictures of your vacation in Spain? Um, didn't even know you were in Spain. Um, they'll, they'll be more than happy to say, no, I didn't do that if it wasn't them. So if you have detected one, what do you do then? Well, if you're using things, something like Gmail or Yahoo or even Hotmail, um, use the spam reporting feature. Because what that does is it, it allows their algorithms that are internal to those, those services uh, to log that as spam, analyze it, and it increases their, their capabilities of detecting uh, those types of attacks and blocking them so that future attacks in that same style won't get through. Um, if you're using an email client like Outlook or Thunderbird or whatever it is your, your company may use, uh, just delete the email into your trash. Uh, again, do not open the attachment associated with any emails like this. Do not click any links in the email. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of times we'll have emails go through. Uh, you know, we'll get we'll get through the spam filters of a client, but then show up in the uh, in the junk folder of Outlook or the junk folder of uh, of Thunderbird. If you see something in in, in junk mail um, and you weren't expecting it, it really should probably be there, and you just need to delete it. Um, if it's important. Again, reach out to that person individually or group individually that, that claims to have sent it and, and see if it was really them. But if it's been, it's, it's been flagged as, as junk mail, it, it probably is actual junk mail. Um, if you're not sure if it's a fish or not, like I said, go to the website directly um, or call the person or company directly that, that's claiming to, to send you that email. And then most importantly, report the incident to your IT department, uh, your manager, your security department, whoever it is that um, is the is just set up to handle these types of issues. Because if it got to you, it, it's possible that it also got to other people, and other people might not be as uh, have noticed the issue. And if your IT department gets a phone call from you saying, hey, I just saw this, uh, they can analyze it. They can make sure that no one else had the issue. They can make sure that no one's clicked it. They can send an email to the company letting everyone else know, hey, if you see this email, don't click the link, don't do this. 
um, we've had we've had plenty of times where the IT department will send out that email and people still click the link. Um, it's important to pay attention to those emails from your security staff and your IT department, uh, especially when they're notifying you guys of, of these types of issues. In your personal life, if you're if you think you've done something and, and something silly or something by accident and you've clicked the link or you've you've submitted credentials to the wrong site, um, these are a few places you can go to to, to make sure that you, you don't uh, become a, a victim, so to speak, of identity theft. Um, you know, always make sure your bank and your credit cards are monitored. Make sure your credit rating, make, monitor your credit rating. There's plenty of ways to do it that don't require money. Um, your national credit report you can get once a year for free. Um, the FTC Theft Consumer Information Site, it's a good place to submit data. The same thing with the uh, FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center. Um, both of them are good places to submit data, but uh, don't expect to hear back from them. A lot of their um, resources are used up when they start seeing a lot of complaints about a similar email attack. And they don't reach out to everyone that, that necessarily files a complaint, but they do work on these things. And when you submit the information, it does help them keep statistics on who's being targeted, what types of people are being targeted, or companies are being targeted. Uh, and, and, and address things accordingly. So let's go into some other forms of social engineering, uh, in particular pretexting, which is uh, in person or over the phone. We're going to focus a little bit on the phone right now. So pretexting is using phone calls uh, to persuade, basically, to, to get the same information out of you that I would like to get out of you uh, via email. Now, with phone calls, it's a little different because maybe the type of information I want is, is uh, is not something I would necessarily request over email, like a credit card number, or I just want to know the right phone number to dial um, to get to the right person. Um, sometimes I'm going to use pretexting just to get enough information out of you to craft that right email, um, to craft an email that, that will actually get through your spam filters and, and, and target you guys properly. Um, we use caller ID spoofing constantly. So if you look at your phone and you see that your mom's calling or you see that your girlfriend or husband's calling, don't, you know, and they start asking more questions or it doesn't sound exactly like them or maybe it's, uh, you know, someone you haven't spoken to in a very long time. Don't necessarily trust caller ID. Um, if your caller ID shows up that it's uh, the fire department and they're claiming that they have to come into your building because they need to inspect your fire, your fire suppression system, um, again, call them back. You know, take take notes, uh, but, but uh, trust but verify as, as I believe it was Reagan said a long time ago, uh, and I do I do feel that's uh, probably the best rule of thumb to, to keep in mind when you're dealing with these kind of things is trust but verify. So information gathered from pretext calls. Um, we do attempt, occasionally try to get usernames and passwords or get passwords reset, um, but more more often than not, we're going after what most people consider less important information, although it's still important, uh, social security numbers, addresses, maiden names, dates of birth, um, account numbers, customer information. Uh, maybe I just want to know which of your customers I should be targeting with emails to try and get them to come to my company uh, and take away business from you. When I'm looking at things like PII, some of it might be seem very innocuous, like what's your address, um, where'd you grow up, you know, mother's maiden name. Some of these things, if you phrase them in conversation properly, don't come across as, as out of the ordinary. Uh, but then once you start thinking about it, you're like, oh wait, those are all the re password reset questions for uh, the people that, uh, the, for, for my bank account. Um, we, we were doing some research once and I, I sent out a, a, a questionnaire a uh, silly questionnaire on Facebook, and it was one of those ones of, let's answer all these questions and see how much we're alike. And there were, uh, I think there were 25 questions total, but scattered in there was, were things like, well, who was your favorite teacher? What was your first dog's name? Uh, what was your first car? What street name? What, what, what was the name of the street you grew up on? Um, all these types of, you know, password reset questions, just to see who would answer. And then, like, the last question, just for, just to see if I could, it would actually happen, was what were the last four years social? And I think we sent out total about 650 of these of these questionnaire type things. And of the 650, we had about 500 people respond. And of those 500 people, over well over 100 actually put down the last four of their social security number, which I'm not sure how that would make it seem uh, how that would make it seem like you're more like me unless our last four were very close together. Um, so again, some of the information we might ask for for over the phone don't seem terribly. Um, strange, but but it does uh, it al it always benefits us in some way that you just might not be able to see on the other end of the phone. 
this is a script example. Um, you know, we, we do actually, when we're, when we're planning pretexts, we, we, we plan them out to some extent. We, we try to keep them a little fluid, and we don't always necessarily stick this script exactly, but this script is the base for, for the attack. And we might try this 15 times, 20 times across different people in a company. And, and then we even come up with scenarios where, okay, if this, if this person's acting a certain way, why don't we try using this, you know, use this phrasing to calm them down or, 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 uh, or have them become a little more compliant. If they're, if they're really compliant, then be very thankful and, and let them know that we'll, you know, we'll reach out again if we need anything else. And thank you so much for the help. Um, you know, but for each pretext, each pretext attack we're, we're going to do, these are the types of calls, that, these are the types of scripts that we write. Um, and, and when you get phone calls from random people um, on your cell phone, for example, saying, oh, we detected a virus on your, on your laptop, they have these types of scripts as well. Um, and those, those phone calls are complete scams. Um, you can just hang up on them, feel free. No one is ever going to call you from Microsoft saying that they've detected a virus on your machine. Um, but again, if they didn't work, they, would, they wouldn't use those attacks if they didn't work. You know, one of my, one of my stories that when, when it comes to pretexting, um, I've, I've, one of the guys I used to work with had gotten a challenge from, uh, from a woman who was interviewing him to uh, capture her boss's cell phone, or not cell phone number, excuse me, credit card number. Uh, and all she, the only information she gave him was she gave him his cell phone number and she gave him his name. So he calls him up and he, pretend, he didn't even spoof caller ID. He just called him up directly. Uh, found out through social media that the guy was in France at the time because he was posting pictures of France, his vacation in France. And so he called him up on his cell phone. The guy answered and he said, hi, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and use my name, for example. He says, hi, Mr. Jones. Um, my name is Dave. I'm calling from Marin Express Fraud Department. And we've been noticing some, some strange charges on your, on your card. And we need to verify that you still have possession of your card. And the guy was, was kind of aggravated. He, he wasn't real thrilled to be bothered on his vacation. Um, so he was a little aggressive. And, and my friend Dave's response to him being a little aggressive, he's like, yeah, I have my card, I have my card, I'm fine. And he's like, okay, well, I, you know, let me, let me verify some of the strange charges. If, if these aren't your charges, then please let us know and we can move forward. But um, did you have like a $600 charge to germandungeons.com? And the guy got really kind of nervous and he's like, no, 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 that wasn't me. And, and just to keep him off, off footing a little bit, he, he came up with some other creative uh, URLs that supposedly very large charges have been made from. Um, so that by the end of it, the guy's like, no, 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 that's not me at all. That's not me at all. And he's like, okay, well, we have to cancel your card so that these charges don't happen anymore. And fully knowing that he was on vacation in, in France. And he's like, no, 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 you can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm on vacation. I need that card. Um, but I'll be, back in, I'll be back in the United States in a week. And, and uh, my friend Dave said, okay, well, let me see if I can do this. And he put him on hold for a minute. And he came back to him and said, okay, well, uh, my boss has said that I can, I can help you out um, since you're on vacation. We don't want you to not have access to your card. Um, so we're going to put some extra monitoring on your card. But first, we need to verify that you still have your physical card in, in your control. So can you read out the, the, the digits off the front of your card to me, please? And so he reads off the digits off the front of the American Express card. And he goes, okay, great. Um, can you also tell me the expiration date? And the, uh, it's because of American Express, the, the CCV number, the security number is on the front of the card. He goes, can you give me the expiration date and those, those other four digits on the front of the card? And he reads those off as well. He said, okay, well, thank you very much. Now that we know that you're, uh, you're still in physical possession of the card, we will, uh, we'll, we'll keep some monitoring on your card. Uh, we might have to call you back again, so please, if you see this number call, uh, call your phone, then make sure you answer, because if, if you don't answer and verify charges, then we have to cancel the card. Uh, and he's like, no, 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 absolutely, I understand. Uh, and he goes, okay, well, I just need to verify a few more items. Um, I need the last four digits of your social. And, and the guy gave me the last four digits of his social. He's like, can you verify the, the credit card address? And he gave him the credit card address. And he's like, okay. And then my friend Dave, just to see if he could get a little bit more information out of him and, and maybe hopefully have this guy detect what was going on, said, okay, last piece of information I need is I need to know your wife's social security number. And the guy even said on the phone, he's like, I don't, I don't know why you'd need this, but it's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> gave, it, gave it right away. Um, so, again, when if someone calls you claiming to be, even if it's your credit card fraud department, um, you can always ask them for a number to call them back at, or use your use your own information. The back every credit card has that has that information on there. You can call any credit card company and say, "Can I please speak to your fraud department?" If they actually called you, they're going to have records that any one of the fraud department can ask. So, um, 
again, trust but verify. Um, so it, if, if you think you're detecting an attack, these are the types of steps you should take. Um, never give out your account information. Um, I don't care if it's someone claiming you owe them $1,000 uh, because of, a, of a, a old debt. I don't care if it's, it's someone claiming to be your doctor and they need your social security number. You should be calling them back um, and call your doctor back directly from the number you know is your doctor's number. Same thing with credit card numbers. Same thing with uh, if someone calls you saying you owe a debt, ask them to send you a letter stating exactly what, what you owe them. Like Have them send something out um, giving you time. You don't have to take care of something like right away. It, it's very rare that, that something is so emergent that you can't hang up the phone, look up a phone number, and, and call someone back that way. Um, if it's against corporate policy that they're trying to get you to do something, don't do it. Um, it, it. It's a policy written for a reason. Those policies have been accepted by the executives and all your bosses and managers. They know those policies as well. Um, they've had to sign off on those to allow them to become policy. So if someone's trying to bully you into it or, or coerce you into doing something like reset a password and give it to them over the phone, uh, don't do it. There's always a, there's always something in place um, that that will allow you to to send information in a certain way to to the people that need to have it. Um, and if there isn't, then you need to reach out to your manager. If you notice something's missing, then reach out to your manager and let them know. Um, always follow your gut. You know, if if someone's calling you and you you feel something is not right. Again, um, hang up on them and call call back the company they're going to be from. That's where the authenticate the caller comes from. Um, you know, you need to make sure you know who you're talking to. Don't assume. Don't don't believe caller ID. Don't believe what someone's saying because it's not always necessarily the truth. And when in doubt, escalate. If you don't think this is the right call, if you think something's weird, um, grab your manager. Ask for help. Reach out to someone that you know does security. Reach out to IT. Reach out to uh, your boss's boss if your boss isn't around. Reach out to a coworker and say, hey, this is what's going on. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. What do you think I should do? So physical on-site social engineering. Um, in person, um, to, to us, physical security from, uh, is key. If we, if we can get access to the building, um, we win. That gives us access to your network. It gives us access to your physical systems. It gives us access to all, all the pieces of paper that are hanging around in the office, in the fire bins, and on your desks that have all the confidential information that we could want. Um, also gives us access to more keys to access other buildings. It gives us access to um, the, the people themselves to get information out of. So um, when we're doing on-site social engineering, we, lo we love it. It's a lot of fun. And we'll do everything from impersonate delivery people to fire inspectors or maintenance workers. Um, property management people coming in to, to check out something, pizza delivery guys, bug sprayers. Um, all, all, you know, if it's something that, that's easily impersonated, and in particular the bug sprayer, um, all that I've gone through, I've gotten through multiple layers of security just with uh, a bug sprayer I bought from Lowe's for 20 bucks filled with water to make it look I'm spraying for bugs. Um, when we're doing these attacks. Um, we want to be likable. We want to be personable. Again, we're not trying to create conflict. Um, we don't want to put people on the defensive. We want them to be helpful. Um, tailgating. Tailgating, you know, I'm sure everybody sees it. Um, following someone through a door after they've badged in or after they've opened it up, it's, it's almost always prohibited, but it still almost always happens, especially through smoker areas. Um, you know, I, I don't smoke anymore, but even when, I'm, when I go on site, I'll still buy a pack of cigarettes and hang out in a smoking area because that's the easiest way to, one, um, make a bond with someone. You know, light their cigarette or, or bum them a cigarette, start talking to them, listen to their conversations. Um, people talk a lot in those smoking areas about what's going on inside or what their, what their gripes are about the company. Um, and then don't really pay attention when you, when you follow them in. Also gives us an idea of what your badges might look like, uh, which allows us to go back and create fake badges. Um, so we won't necessarily create a, a whole fake ID. We'll just literally make a badge with a piece of paper laid over it that, that looks color scheme wise and picture enough that it matches similar at, at first glance to your badges. Um, and again, trying to get that knowledge of, of the company, the processes, or staff through phone calls, through emails, through social media, all of the, all those things we'll, we'll take into consideration when we're planning an on-site attack. And then team two can, can create a subtle discretion. Um, I've, I've had a jobs where um, I walked into the back door while my coworker was, was literally kind of being the sacrificial lamb uh, and blowing him, blowing his cover, so to speak, on purpose to grab the, the attention of security in the front while I went and tailgated someone in the back. 
And when we get access to these buildings, we're going to do things like um, we're going to leave behind little devices, uh, whether they're USB drives or, or network devices we can plug in that will call home to us over your own network connection or give us access to your network connection through a cellular modem built into that device. Something else we do when we're doing physical and on-site social engineering is we'll go through the dumpsters. Um, We'll go looking for maybe who got fired recently. Um, you know, when people get fired, they don't tend to sort through their data properly. They just kind of dump it all into a trash can and throw it all in the trash. Um, we personally, <laughs> as, as horrible as it is, we personally find uh, a lot of information when someone gets fired because, again, all their data from the, however long they had that job is now just hanging out in the trash. Sometimes it's passwords. Sometimes it's internal phone numbers. Sometimes it's uh, customer information user IDs and passwords written down on, on scraps of paper, uh, confidential documents, maybe it's plans on property that the company is getting ready to buy or people that they're getting ready to hire or a project they're getting ready to start work on. Now, it is really kind of gross to have to dig through a trash can because um, you're not just looking at paper, you're looking at coffee grounds, you're looking at all kinds of, of nastiness that people throw in trash every day. Um, so I'd rather call for it, but, but sometimes that <laughs> Sometimes we'll go, if we can't get the information through a phone call, we'll go through the dumpster. So basically make sure you shred everything. Uh, if it's got sensitive information on it, you should shred it. If, if you don't have a shred bin, ask for one. Um, and be careful at the same time what you're throwing away in those shred bins because those locks are not the best things in the world either. Um, you can always request your, your shredder company. If you have a service, you can request those guys to, to increase the security lock, the, the, the locks on those, uh, on those bins. Um, so ways to thwart throw, throw the physical attack. Um, establish and follow on-site procedures. So again, if you guys have badges, um, there should be a, a requirement that all badges be shown uh, while you're on site. Um, I would also recommend that um, if that if that is the case, I'd make a separate uh, addendum to that saying that when you leave the facility, all badges need to be in your pocket or in your purse or, or uh, in a non-visible area because um, one of our tricks is to hang out at the local Starbucks. So whatever Starbucks is closest to the building that, that, uh, that is uh, next to the Target building and, and wait and just watch the people walk in, get an idea of what their badges look like um, and, and use that information to, to better our own attack and make our attack more successful. Um, establish and follow a clean desk policy. You know, if you guys aren't, aren't working on something, it shouldn't be on your desk. If, if there's paperwork that has uh, client information or some other sensitive information on it, and you don't need it right away, or you're not working on it right away, it should be left in your desk drawers. Um, it should also be, um, you should also have a clear desk when you walk away for the day, or walk away for lunch. You know, take, take your stuff you're working on, put it in your desk, lock it up. Same thing with your computer. Um, most companies do this now, but there should be a lock system uh, after 10 or 15 minutes of delay that locks that screen. And, and you know, if you walk away from your computer for long enough, it's going to lock and require you to put in your password again. That prevents people from, like us from coming in and, and using those computers to access the network, access uh, data on shared drives, as you. Um, so trust me, when if, if something were to happen, horribly, you know, something horrible were to happen in the, inside the company, um, you don't want your credentials being the ones that got used uh, to access all this information. Don't allow someone to tailgate into an office. Um, it, it's you don't have to be mean about it, um, and that's one of the reasons tailgating seems to usually work is because people don't want to be confrontational. They don't want to be rude. Um, but if you notice someone that's coming in behind you, whether whether they belong there or not, whether you think they belong there or not, may, maybe the person that you recognize was actually fired last week or two weeks ago, and you didn't know it. Um, so even people you recognize, you just still make sure, hey. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I need to see your badge. If it's someone that you don't recognize, it's even easier because you can still be polite and say, hey, can I help you? Or, hey, you know, are you kind of lost? Are you looking for somebody in particular? Um, you know, do you have a badge? Are you from another office? Like, there's ways to present yourself that aren't rude uh, and, and still um, give you the ability to detect these people that shouldn't be in your facilities. Um, always ensure exterior doors are, are completely shut. And what I mean by that are, you know, we've, we've seen plenty, plenty of doors, especially back doors, uh, again, into smoking areas sometimes or delivery areas where when you walk through, they just don't latch properly. Um, you know, first off, just take a second and pull it shut. But also report that issue to maintenance or to your manager or to whoever it is that's supposed to be in charge of facilities because that's something that shouldn't, shouldn't 
remain that way for very long. That's something that should be an easy, easy and quick fix. Um, more on the IT side, and, and I don't think most of your most of your average user wouldn't have access to this, but disabling network jacks, um, unless they are specific for, for you know, specifically going to be used for a printer or a computer or a workstation. Uh, if you have the network jacks just hanging out all over the office, turn off the ones you're not using. Um, that way, if someone did get into the building, um, say with a leave behind or a small PC, um, they're not able to use that network jack by just plugging it in, get a DHCP address, and walk away. And then again, like I mentioned, um, shredding documents with a cross-cut shredder um, or, or, or a highly secured uh, burn bin or, or shred bin from, an external, from a third-party service um, is always recommended. I would also say that when you guys have printer areas or copy room areas, make sure that if you're sending something to a, to a shared printer, you go get it right away. Don't let it hang out there for a while. Don't let it sit in a mailbox for a while. Go get it when, when you need it. So that's the presentation overall. Um, if you guys have any questions, again, please feel free to put them into the question box in the, uh, in the uh, webinar application. And let's see if we have any so far. We have one, Ryan. Only one? Um, OK. Yes. So here we go. It is, how safe is it to click on unsubscribe links in, in an email that you think is not a phishing email? Okay, um, that's a really good question. I, I use, <laughs> I have to do this every now and then as well because I suddenly find myself on large numbers of, of unsolicited emails or spam or whatever you want to call it. Um, if it's something that, I, for, say from a company, I recognize because I went to their website, um, I don't have any issues clicking an unsubscribe link, but I do still pay attention to that link. So most places just say unsubscribe and they just kind of highlight it and make it a hyperlink so that if you hover over it, you should still see that, um, you still see that URL. Um, most of those URLs will, will sound kind of marketing in their name um, or, or, or advertising in their name because that's usually the type of software they're using to send out those mass emails. Um, there's nothing terribly uh, scary about doing that because as long as it's only asking you for your email address, and most of them don't even do that, um, the very legitimate ones, when you click the link, it already knows what email address you're sending it from. Um, on rare occasions, um, people will send those out and, and hope that you unsubscribe because then it verifies your email address. The worst case scenario at that point is that they know your email address and they'll send you more spam. Um, do not, you should never have to put in a password though. You should never have to say why you don't want to receive. I mean, it, you can always say other if they're asking why, um, why you want to unsubscribe. But uh, as far as using those unsubscribe links, as long as it's not having you open up a file or having you do something weird uh, or giving you some kind of weird error message, you should be fine. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right, and that was it for the questions. Oh, no, one just popped up. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, looks like you mentioned the call from Microsoft Tech Support phone calls. I've been, I've I've called a half dozen times from these type of scammers, uh, and they do a good job at making things sound scary and ultra important to comply with allowing them to access your computer. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of one of their giveaways. I mean, first off, they're, they're impersonating somebody that you've never paid money to. Um, again, you, you might have paid money in an indirect fashion by buying a computer with Windows on it but you have not paid Microsoft uh, enough money for them to call you personally and say, oh my God, we noticed a virus on your computer. Um, and and there's, even if you had paid Microsoft, they wouldn't need you to, say, install software to give them remote access. If you've paid money to them for, the, for that kind of service, they already have something set up with your company or with you personally to be able to do that. Um, and, that and that goes for anybody, not just Microsoft. Apple doesn't call you and say your iPhone has a virus. Um, please go to this website. Um, you know, these, these types of scams, the second they ask you to do something is, is your, kind of your giveaway. Oh, go to this website. Oh, download the software. That's your giveaway that no matter how scary it sounds, um, it, it's, 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 not, it's just not true. And if, you, and if you think that it might be true, then take the information from them that they're saying you have, like ask specifics. Ask them which virus it is. If they can detect that you have a virus, then they're going to know which one it is. And if they give you the name, then go off to Best Buy or go off to someone that you know that knows security or computers or there's even just, a, you know, even the IT admin in your own company and say, hey, I got this weird phone call. 
they say this, can you take a look for three seconds at my PC and, and see if that's even true because they wanted me to do a bunch of stuff that, that just made it seem kind of hinky. Um, so yeah, there's always, you know, there's always reach out for help and, there, and I'm pretty sure just about everyone in this world knows someone or can at least go to a, a, a valid company, whether that's Best Buy, for example. Uh, I'm not trying to endorse Best Buy by any practice, by any means, but um, you know, that kind of company that can help you for a small fee if you're, if you're really worried about it. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Let's see. I don't see any more questions, but we still okay. do have about 10 more minutes here. So feel free to okay. put them in. And you can ask questions about anything. <laughs> if you've had experiences in the past with social engineering and you want to ask, like, hey, should I have done this a different way? Um, feel free to ask those kinds of questions. Um. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess we don't have any more questions. Yep. <laughs> well, no there's more. my email address. <laughs> So if you come up with a question later, um, feel free to email me, and, uh, and I'll do my best to get it answered uh, quickly. All right. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Have a great day.